Hello and welcome to our Writer in Residence session, Writing for Gaming, Part 2. So gaming writer and designer Steve Ince will be completing his Writing for Gaming sessions today. So please feel free to send in your questions for him as we go along on the live feed and we'll uh, try and ask Steve them. Okay, so I'd like to introduce Steve. Good morning. Hey then. And Chris, Christina, our Writer in Residence. Hi, Good morning, Chris. Okay, so over to you. Hi, everybody, and thank you for watching. And you might be watching on catch up. You might be watching live. The benefits of watching live is you can send questions in right now, and hopefully, Steve will be able to answer them for you. Um, just to start off with, if you haven't seen the first session, you can go back and watch it again on the Kirklees Library's YouTube channel, which is a treasure trove of fantastic sessions for adults, for children, for anybody. Even if you're not into books, there's really interesting stuff on there. And so we invited Steve to do two sessions for us. Um, if you look at the previous session, I read out all his accolades, and I'm not going to do it again because he's proved his method. <laughs> <laughs> he's fantastic. And I've had a lot of people chatting to me before these sessions and in between asking me about what's what's going to be looked at in the in the second session and people who've had a play with the stuff that Steve mentioned in the previous session but if you haven't seen it doesn't matter because you'll, you'll catch up very quickly on, on what we're going to be talking about but just to start off with um something that somebody mentioned to me yesterday was a really interesting um article that was published by royal society publishing and this is in relation to the issue of gaming so we're going to start off talking about gaming per se but this is about how a lot of us parents in particular really see gaming as a battle as a fight um, as something that's you know trying to stop our children from having a wonderful and fulfilling education and it was really heartening I think to see this article come out and do, do look it up if you can do it came out a couple of days ago um, and it basically it summarizes it just basically puts together lots of evidence um, testing that they've done of the effect of gaming on people's mental well-being and the evidence is positive the evidence is overwhelmingly positive and it was really encouraging to read that and the, the longer article explains all the positive benefits that you, you can gain from gaming on, on mental health so that's good to start off with gaming is great fantastic even if you don't do it don't do down other people that don't because it's, it's it's a fantastic um just way of occupying yourself but problem solving as well which we'll come on to in a minute but in terms of literacy which is obviously what the writer in residence program is all about this is the reason why we've, we've asked steve to come and share with us his experience on writing for gaming because i think people just think writing is a thing that happens um gaming is another thing that happens to put them two together the, the disciplines and and the skills and the experiences of both this is the guy that that's got it all really so what i was pleased about was this is the bible those of you that are already into the world of writing will be familiar with the bible the bible of writers and artists and i was just saying for i wondered if anybody had included gaming in this because it, it covers every single type of writing that you can imagine and for the first time in 2020 i have seen a fantastic article on writing for gaming so that's another great introduction for you and it's good because finally it's arrived as a discipline um and as a way of basically exercising your literacy and improving your literacy which we can talk a, a little bit about later on so i'm going to hand over to steve now now that I've, I've picked him up and hopefully um hopefully steve will be able to tell you what he did in the previous session and you can get a quick catch up and then we'll move on to um what he's going to share with you next so thank you and over to you steve <laughs> Uh, thanks, Chris. Um, just picking up on on the aspects of literacy and 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 and, and stuff. Um, lots of games are very action orientated, and um, we don't get that kind of um, you know literacy necessarily coming through. But that's not not necessarily you know sort of that that you you lose out in any way because there is lots of hand eye coordination, lots of problem solving, and stuff like this. But I do know that you know some years ago when I worked on on the Broken Sword games, we actually heard from some some people in in Germany and and France who said that playing those games actually helped them to learn English because they would you know sort of like put the voices on in their language but put the text on in English. So there is the potential to kind of do so much more um, with games than than what we initially see 
And I think that there are so many benefits and, and you know, any health benefits, you know, kind of maybe aren't as, as obvious, but are they definitely there. And I think that's that's fabulous. Anyway, on to the good stuff. <laughs> I mean, gaming is, is all good stuff. And this is obviously the second part of my workshop. Um, and um, I'm going to share my screen. Uh, hopefully, there we go. Um, so obviously, a nice picture of me on 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 this episode. We've even got the same hat. <laughs> right. Um, this time we're going to, you know, sort of. I was going to, you know, sort of like begin with with questions, but um, apparently not very many have, have, have arisen. So what we'll do is we'll go into further detail, building on. The previous session um, and looking at you know kind of like any problems that might have arisen um, and then we're going to learn about the power of boolean variables which may be a little <laughs> worrying for some of you but but i'll try and uh, be gentle with you all <laughs> so There we go. Sorry, I'm sort of uh, got so many things open at the moment. Though. So, if you haven't watched the the first part of this workshop, it's it's obviously available uh, on the Kerclean's Library's various pages, Facebook and YouTube and so on. Um, and this part will be available uh, afterwards as well. Um, and the advantage of watching it later um, or watching it again is that you can pause and undo your own stuff as as you as you watch it so as we don't have any immediate questions um but don't please send any in and and um nicola and and, and chris will will try and, and and slot them in as as appropriate so in the first part of the workshop um we looked at developing an interactive story to the point where our stories were becoming more involved. We looked at how a basic structure could be expanded through multiple endings, a branching narrative, and much more complex forms. Now, if some of you have been trying to make your own interactive stories since the last session, you may now realize that issues arise as a result of this complexity and so we need to think about how we might address those problems excuse me a moment right if we look at twine and open the complex narrative um, example that i created um, and play it one of the things that that becomes evident quite quickly in this is that if you talk to the workman at the street and, and go, go to the interrogation we can walk talk to the workman up the street and get the interrogation again so we're getting re repetition here and we're in this kind of loop so if we look for the killer and then look for clues we can call nicole yeah we haven't even met her yet so there are issues here that go beyond um, the initial problems so if we go back to yeah, hold on. the problems are a result of the narrative not responding fully to our actions as players we're making choices and reading each part of the story but nothing tells the system that this has happened in order to fix these problems we require some way of making a note of the things the player character has done and the information gained now the best way to keep track of changes is to think in terms of true and false and use these values to switch on and on and off the things the player has seen or interacted with boolean, boolean variables have exactly this quality 
they can only ever be true or false. If used in the right way, they can represent almost anything you want them to. Yes or no, up or down, in or out, I have an apple or I don't have an apple. And for those of you who think that we might be getting into the scary realm of programming, this really isn't the case. The use of Booleans really only comes in in the form of checking values and acting upon them. It's about thinking logically and using the variables to make that work. So if the player character learns the name of a cat is Millie, we can set a variable to true. At another point, we might want to check if this variable is true or false. And if it is true, then we could lure it over by calling its name. Otherwise, because we don't know the cat's names, name, it will ignore us. Now, different systems have different conventions for the naming of variables. In Twine, the names of variables always begin with the dollar sign. So a variable for knowing the cat's name could be cat, cat sorry, dollar cat underscore name. Now, spaces are not allowed in variable names, but you can use an underscore to make them more readable. However, this variable is not meant to represent the cat's name, but whether the player character knows the name. So a better variable name would be dollar no underscore cat underscore name, which from now on, I'm going to read as no cat name. Um, just, just because, you know, sort of, it becomes a mouthful. But by giving these variables readable, understandable names, you should always know what each of them represents. So if we go back to Twine and open this, it seems fairly simple. It's, a, it's called find a clue. I've created something um, to demonstrate the initial part of this. The first passage is fairly straightforward. Hide that again. Mary is searching for the old family house, looking for a clue to the whereabouts of her mother. She spots a cat in the back garden. And obviously this is a link to the back garden. As I demonstrated last time, links are you know, created by surrounding them with double square brackets. <clears throat> The second passage is where I'm testing for the variables. So in the garden, Mary finds that the cat is very wary and keeps away from her. And now it's, this is a test for if no cat name is true. It has to be in these round brackets, you know, sort of, it has to be if colon space dollar no underscore cat underscore name you know it has to have a proper variable format name and then is true because these variables are only ever true or false um this starts you know sort of like what we want to call within um you know depending on whether that information is or that variable is true and this is a known as a hook and so it starts here with a single square bracket and ends here with uh, another single one. Um, and then if we know the cat's name is true, I can link to a passage called call the cat's name. If it isn't true, if it's false, we can link to a passage called call the cat. Um, Oh, sorry. Else means, you know, the opposite of, or, you know, anything else other than is true. And in this case, not true or false, if you like. <clears throat> and it's important to get, you know, kind of like these brackets and, you know, sort of in the right places, um, because, you know, sort of without them, you will you know, find problems and it, it can cause problems when it comes to playing them. But you'll, you'll quickly get into the habit of, of, of doing these. 
and um, the stories um, that I've created in Twine will be available after. Um, I don't know how Nicola will will you know sort of link to that, but you can download them and import them into Twine and look at exactly how they're constructed. Um, so if I play this, Mary's searching the old family house. She spots a cat in the back garden. So I click on that. She calls the cat and the cat ignores Mary. We are only getting the call the cat passage because there is no place where we set the variable to true. <coughs> Excuse me. So if I now open a second version of this, oh, that's the wrong one. Um, the first two passages are the same. But I've added more to call the cat. So if we have a look at that, here, Puss Puss, the cat ignores Mary. She can go back into the house and carry on searching, or she can look over the fence. And if, we, if she looks over the fence, she sees a neighbour and talks to the neighbour and discovers the name of the cat. She, knows, she discovers the name of the cat is Millie. So we set the variable here, set colon no cat name to true within these uh, round brackets. And then we have call the cat's name and an additional one here, small key. So if I play it, Mary's searching the old family house, looking for a clue to the whereabouts of her mother. She spots a cat in the back garden. In the garden, Mary finds that the cat is very wary and keeps away from her. Here, Puss Puss, the cat ignores Mary. She can go back into the house and carry on searching, or she can look over the fence. Mary walks over to the fence and looks over it. Her mother's neighbour is doing some gardening, so Mary introduces herself and explains that she's trying to find her mother. The neighbour says that she hasn't seen her for over a week. So Mary asks the woman if she knows the cat, and she thinks that it's a stray called Millie. Mary can now return to the middle of the back garden. In the garden, Mary finds the cat is very wary and keeps away from her. Call the cat's name. Here, Millie. Come here, Millie. The cat comes over to Mary and nuzzles her hand. On her collar is a small key. Mary removes the key from the collar and recognises it as belonging to her mother. Perhaps this is just the clue she was looking for. She just needs to find what it fits. <clears throat> so we can see, you know, sort of like, you know, the option from the back garden changes after finding the cat's name. And Mary can call the cat's name. As a result of this, she gets the clue she was looking for, a small key. The player has found their way through the story to the key Mary needs. So if we look again at the back garden passage, we can see that both times we get this same text. Um, about Mary finding the cat very wary. It would be better if we could improve this in some way. So if we open a third version or find a clue from this, this diagram, it looks more or less exactly the same, except <clears throat> inside here, I've all, I've, these if and else statements are exactly the same, except I've put more text into each of them. So they're slightly different from each other. So that if I play it now, 
In the garden, Mary finds that the cat is very wary and keeps away from her. She can call the cat, but it ignores her. So we, we find out the cat's name. We go back to the garden, the centre of the garden, and cut. And this time we have the cat is still wary. So Mary crouches down and offers her hand. We have a change in the you know sort of text that we display based upon that. So we can call the cat's name and get the the small key as before. <coughs> If I show you that again, just so you can see. So if no cat name is true, we get this second part. Else, we get the first part. Okay. One thing you may also notice is actually I now set um, found small key to true. Now, I'm not using it in this little story, um, but if I was to expand the story, then obviously at some, at some point later in the in the story, I might be checking for that variable, particularly if I found the find the object that the um, the key fits, a small chest or or something like that. Um, and it's it's a really good habit to get into is the setting of of these very these kinds of variables you know kind of at key points finding objects obtaining information and, and, and so forth <clears throat> now what i want to suggest is you should now attempt to use boolean variables in this way in your own stories perhaps it would be best to, to start a new story i mean you know sort of because just to keep it simple and then build on that but test what you're doing as you go along by playing the game through. Keep playing, build a bit more and play. And this is how game testing works. You test as you go. If you have any problems, check your formatting is correct and that the spelling of your variables is consistent. Even with the greatest experience, we all misspell the names of variables at times or put a bracket in the wrong place, which can be frustrating to track down. Right, so carrying on. If I look at a new version of the complex narrative that I created last time, or reference last time, shall we say? It looks a lot more intricate than it did previously, um, and this is because I'm using a lot more links and and, and the like. Um, but it works so much better because of the boolean variables I'm using. Now the first passage explosion is exactly the same as it was in the previous version, and basically setting the scene and giving three options of where the player can go. <coughs> Excuse me. Rec Cafe passage is the same, and so is search the briefcase. <coughs> now, the look for the killer passage <coughs> is has become a bit of a hub because there are so many other passages pointing back to it. And in this passage, I test for a couple of variables. I test if, if got sewer key is true. Um, and if interrogation complete is not true. I'll come on to that in a moment. <clears throat> um, and the way this works is that um, George, the main the player character, needs to find this sewer key in order to, to progress in the game. So we'll, we'll come to that later. <clears throat> The Wakeman passage um, has got a test for interrogation complete is true um, and another variable got sewer key is set. 
um, I'm also testing for the got Nicole number, which is relevant to, you know, kind of like, if you've got Nicole number, you've already met Nicole. Um, so you don't need to meet her again. Okay, where are we? Interrogation, I don't check for any variables, but I set a variable interrogation complete to true. In meet Nicole, I don't check any variables, but I set got Nicole number to true, as well as a second variable met Nicole. Now setting two variables may seem a bit of, you know, kind of like um, unnecessary coverage, but I will explain as I go along. In look for clues, I check if got Nicole number is true, as well as a second variable. No, sorry. It is George can call Nicole. Sorry. I check for Nick got Nicole number is true. If it is George can call Nicole. If not, he can talk to the policeman. <laughs> sorry, there's so many variables. I'm losing track of where I am in my notes. <laughs> I do apologize. In the policeman passage, George gets Nicole's number off the officer and is now able to call her. So I set the you know, got Nicole number to true. In the final passage, I, I check for the met Nicole variable because I want the phone conversation to start differently depending on whether all, George already met her or not. This is why I need to have two variables because they serve different purposes. Okay, so if I play the game, I can enter the rec cafe, and I can search for the briefcase, and now I can look for the killer or talk to the workman. George is about to talk to the workman when the police show up. So we go to the interrogation, and we can talk to the workman again, and this time we get a different um, piece of text, and we get different links. So now we can look for the killer using the sewer key to lift the cover. George descends into the darkness with some trepidation. So he looks for clues. George, George searches the sewer and finds some clues the killer left behind. George can talk to the policeman standing guide outside the cafe. George talks to the police officer and is able to get the phone number he saw of the woman he saw taking photos. He can now call Nicole. George introduces himself and explains that he was outside the cafe when the bomb went off. Nicole is cautious, so George explains about the clues he's found. Nicole is impressed with George's dis detective work. She invites him over so they can dis discuss the case further. So we've got a game that plays through. Um, makes sense. There is no repetition. There are no loops. Um, and if we um, if we were to play it again, we would we could take a different route. We could go straight to this. We can go then back to the cafe, talk to the workman, interrogation, meet Nicole, look for the killer, talk to the workman, look for the killer again, look for clues, call Nicole, and so on. Um, so we get different routes through this based upon the links I've set up and the variables that I'm setting and checking for as I go along. Okay, so if we go back to the look for the killer, you see that I'm testing for interrogation complete is not true. Now in Twine, if I if I check for a variable being false, it actually doesn't work unless I have previously set that variable to false. What this would mean is that you have to check, you would have to set every single variable you use in your game or story to false 
in the opening passage before being able to check any of them. So the best way to approach this is to check if it's not true. This is why I generally check for variables being true and use else for the alternative. But here, it just, you know, sort of like works better if I use is not true. Sometimes you have to adapt to, you know, sort of the, the needs of the situation as it were. Now I'd like to look in a little more detail at our game scenes. However, because games are very different from each other and have varying writing needs, I can't give you one specific way to do this or a specific format in which to write script or dialogue for games. I can only give you some idea of what to expect, <coughs> excuse me, and the kind of things to think about when approaching the writing. Sometimes a studio will be open to working with your approach, but usually they have their own ways of doing things. Above all else, you must be able to adapt to the needs of the project, but the basic principles I'm covering should still apply. So if we return to Twine, and I open talk to Wilkes. Now this looks very simple as it only contains two passages and in the first one I'm effectively just setting the scene. Detective Edwards arrives at the scene of a murder and spots a guy called Wilkes. The player is given the option to talk to Wilkes. The second passage contains the scene proper and looks quite complex. In here, I'm checking a number of variables and setting a couple to true at the relevant points. So if I go through, we have a, a variable here called at the top called leather jacket, <coughs> which I'm testing for here and setting down here. Um, but that only happens if this variable is true. So leather jacket represents finding the clue about the, you know, suspect wearing leather jacket. We then have a variable called Wilkes shooting. Now, basically, this is a variable to mark the fact that Edwards talks to Wilkes about the shooting so that we immediately set it to true once we've had this part of the conversation here. <clears throat> uh, and then we won't have it again. So we don't get repeat that, that part of the conversation repeated. See, so if Edwards approaches him again, Wilkes hasn't claimed to have nothing further to say. So this leather jacket if goes all the way down to here. So if leather jacket is not true, then all this works through. If Wilkes shooting is not true, then this applies, else that applies. And then if Johnny shooting is true, this applies. And Johnny shooting represents Edwards having talked to Johnny, another character, about the shooting. If leather jacket is as is true, as in here, we will get this else part where Wilkes tells Edwards to get lost. So if we play this, no, sorry. If we open Wilkes 2, I've got the same structure. But here I've, I've put a lot more detail into these. The structure the, of the um, the actual story elements and the conversation elements are exactly the same, except I've expanded it 
with more detail so it reads more like a story um, <clears throat> and if I open a third version of this no that's the second version sorry. if I open the third version of this you'll see that we have the same structure again but this time I've written it in a different format a little more like you might write a script for a play or something like this now if you're writing for a game where lines will be recorded or where dialogue lines are placed on screen this is a better format than the previous one um, because you're, it's less about writing a story <clears throat> so take try writing your own stories with different levels of details or in different style remember you can duplicate your story if you don't want to change the existing one so if we go back to the first books and play it through <coughs> detective edwards arrives on the scene another street murder another female victim another wasted life he takes a moment to gather his thoughts then spots a guy called wilkes standing nearby so he talks to wilkes edwards asks wilkes if he saw the shooting but he says he didn't again we're not triggering any more of the conversation So if we look, we're missing this part here and we're not setting the Johnny shooting variable to true at any point. If we're thinking in terms of, you know, beginnings, middles and ends, in terms of our simple structure, we have the beginning and the end, but we don't trigger the end because we don't, we're missing that middle part. So if I open Wilkes and Johnny, the beginning is pretty much the same, except we now have two, two options, talk to Wilkes or talk to Johnny. And if we look at this passage that we had before, I've got um, a couple of options, you know, sort of based on if leather jacket is true, add the leather jacket clue, else talk to Johnny. So these are two links based upon the leather jacket clue now. <clears throat> As before, if I play it, sorry, we can talk to Wilkes. Edwards asks Wilkes if he saw the shooting, but he says he didn't. So now we can go and talk to Johnny. Edwards asked Johnny about the shooting. Johnny heard the shot, and when he ran, when he turned the corner, Wilk says Wilkes was near the body. So we go back and talk to Wilkes again. Wilkes says he has nothing further to say, but Edward says that Johnny saw Wilkes near the body. Wilkes is worried he'll get the blame. So he says he saw a man in a leather jacket run away. So now we've got the leather jacket clue. Edwards has a new clue. The killer was a man wearing a leather jacket. And so the investigation can continue. <laughs> <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, <clears throat> so if we think about beginnings, middles and ends, we get the beginning part in the first part of the Wilkes conversation. We talk to Johnny to get the middle. And finally, we talk to Wilkes again to get the end of this little sequence and obtain the clue. But what happens if we talk to Johnny first? So if I play it again, and talk to Johnny. Edwards asked Johnny about the shooting. Johnny heard the shot, and when he turned the corner, Wilkes was near the body. So we talked to Wilkes. Edwards asked Wilkes if he saw the shooting, but he says he didn't. So Edwards says that Johnny saw Wilkes near the body. And Wilkes is worried that he'll get the blame. 
he says he saw a man in a leather jacket run away so we get the leather jacket clue again <clears throat> what this means is that talking to Johnny first gives us a new beginning to the sequence with the middle and end in the conversation with Wilkes and what this means is that the interactive sequence works both ways due to the way I set and check the variables and as before this is a very basic version of the scene and we can put more details as required As before, I created different levels of detail, so we've gone different styles. So if we, I've got the wrong one. If we look at Wilkes and Johnny 2, we can see that, like in the Johnny um, conversation, what can you tell me about the shooting? He asks, Johnny is where he is, and so on. We've got more detail to make it more like a story. And then if I, open the third version we have again something that's more like a script in its presentation so if i were to play this <clears throat> we talked to wilkes so hey wilkes what's up i heard you witness a shooting that's so just tell me what happened get lost i didn't see nothing so we go and talk to johnny Hi, Johnny. You, you always turn up when there's trouble, Edwards. I ain't done nothing. What can you tell me about the shooting? What makes you think I know anything? You always, you always know whether you're involved or not. I heard the shot, but when I came round the corner, she was already dead, and Wilkes was near the body. So we can talk to Wilkes again. Hey, Wilkes, I got nothing to say. Your friend Johnny saw you with the body. That junkie ain't fingering me. It's not looking good, man. Look, all I saw was a guy in a leather jacket running away. The woman was already dead. Thanks. So now we have the leather jacket cloak again. So we can create the same thing in a different level of detail, a different style, and make it you know, completely playable as before. So what you can do is use this information to develop your own stories into something rich <clears throat> exciting giving the player interesting options take it slowly and think everything through if something isn't working take the time to figure it out you could work with a friend perhaps and help each other out each of you could play through the other person's story and offer constructive help and suggestions you could also point out to each other if there are problems with dead ends, repetitions, or links not working. Don't forget, this isn't a test, and there are plenty of right approaches to making these stories. As long as you can create an interactive story and enjoy the process, you have already achieved so much. <clears throat> I've now given you a lot to think about and enough information for you to be able to create your own interactive stories if you're not already doing so. <clears throat> if you're struggling with the pace at which I've delivered these two parts of the workshop, you can replay the videos of the sessions and watch them at your own pace. If you have any specific questions, you can post them in the comments and I'll try to answer them as swiftly as possible. When you're happy with your stories, why not share them with your friends? However, if they enjoy them, you'll have to write more, of course. <laughs> and before I finish, I'd like to mention a few more things related to game writing and the process involved. Because games have incredible variety, it's difficult to apply the same details to each project. So I will talk about this in a very general sense. A game story is generally huge, with it being told over many hours of gameplay. So to write and develop it properly, it must go through a number of versions, improving and adding details with each one. This process is known as iteration, if you didn't already know, and is vital to ensuring the story fits the design as both are developed. And it's pretty much impossible to write a rich game story without this iterative approach. <clears throat> For instance, we might take the brief story about Gary's invitation 
I mentioned in the first part of the workshop and add in more details and characters and plot twists with each iteration. The process of iteration can be thought of like a pyramid where you start at the top with an idea that's low in detail and each layer down is larger because it has more detail until you get down to the base which is where everything should be complete. <clears throat> the analogy does not relate to building a pyramid because then you'd start from the bottom and work your way up. So it's more like one of discovery and exploration. You might have a clear idea of the shape of the pyramid, the game that you want to create, but you have no idea what the details are that make up the insides. So if you enter the pyramid at the top and explore one level at a time, as you finish each layer of detail, each iteration as it were, you will have a much more complete picture until you finally reach the bottom and you know the story inside out. In a very real sense, you're creating the interior of the pyramid as you, as you explore the project's ideas. <clears throat> now this is a very rough and simple version of the iteration process to show how it works. At the high level, you've probably got a fair, you know, going to be just a few pages of the main ideas and the main characters presented with the gameplay in mind to ensure everything sits within the scope of the project. You know, it probably include a brief story synopsis of this at this high level stage. The story and plot outline is where it starts to feel more like a proper story with further characters added, the plot starting to shape, take shape and where exciting conflict is developed. Because the game is interactive and the story may have some branching aspects and so forth, it's usually a good idea to also develop a flowchart, perhaps even entwine, so you can see the shape of the interactive plot you're creating. <clears throat> the level breakdown is where you develop the story and design into a series of gameplay levels or chapters or sections or whatever they might be called, depending on the nature of the game. <clears throat> the story objectives and obstacles should tie in with those of the gameplay. Each level may need its own flowchart and other diagrams such as maps, but that may not be the writer's job to create those. Now, the detail and dialogue is obviously you know the last thing to complete but you complete the story and design details before embarking on the final version of the dialogue only then will you know that everything is ready for those well-crafted lines that characters will speak now there are more like there, there are likely to be more stages than this depending on how a team works and each of these layers will likely have their own iterative process on a smaller scale as each specific details <clears throat> are discussed, revined and agreed. Each could have their own iteration pyramid, so to speak. Now, a writer is involved with many aspects of story, characters and so forth, but the dialogue is where the player gets the most direct connection to what they do. Although the principles of creating strong dialogue are the same as in other media, the mechanics of how we go about delivering it can vary greatly because games are so different from one another. It's important for a writer to be able to adapt to the needs of each particular project as a, at the same time as writing great dialogue. Now, when writing for film and TV, there are script formats that have become industry standards in order to make things easier for everyone concerned. With games, there is no standard format. Some think this is a bad thing, but in many ways, it's important for a script or writing format to be appropriate for the game you're working on. Game styles vary so much, so a format that works for an RPG probably won't work for a platform adventure. Of course, you don't need to write your own interactive stories in a script-like style. It's your story, so you should be able, <clears throat> so you should write it in the way that best fits with your ideas. You can use images or snippets of video. You can create something that uses live action. Perhaps you could use, just use recorded lines for people with sight problems, like a kind of interactive radio player. You could write in prose or rap lyrics or even poetry. 
for the game Godfire, Rise of Prometheus, I used the rhyme in voiceover for the promotional video, which sounded like this. Advancing unto destiny strides Prometheus unbound. A titan fierce and eager, a champion thus found. Though the gods contest it, he fights with every breath. Naught will stand before him. Saving me. Abreast the waves of peril, storms and fury drive, defiling fell tempests, Prometheus drives. It's important for a writer to work closely with the design team, and these two aspects should really go hand in hand. If the story and design don't link with each other, the game can feel disjointed, so everyone must see the same vision for the game. This makes it easy for the writer to create the various game scenes and ensure they match the way the design is developing. It also makes sure that the writer doesn't put anything into the story that cannot be accommodated within the gameplay mechanics. <clears throat> A writer's relationship with development teams will always be variable and it's likely that people will often underestimate the level of work that goes into creating all the elements of a story in a way that fits with the design. And this is something you will have to help them understand <laughs> often. You may not fully appreciate the amount of work yourself at first. However, when you write your own stories in Twine, you will begin to see the work involved in writing them. They're fun to create, but can also entail quite a bit of work. Games and interactive stories can only get better as time passes. The tools to create them will improve too. This is an exciting time to be starting out in this field and I hope that you can build on the things I have covered in these two workshops. If you get to the point of creating quality interactive stories, I hope you'll deliver all the excitement conflict, drama, humour and character development you'd want to see in the games that you play. Have fun. Thank you. Okay, anything further? Okay, uh, yes, we've got a couple, a couple of comments here, Steve, I'll show you there. Um, Adele, Adam. I, suppose, I think I get it now, a way for the programme to keep track of what the player knows and what they don't know and how that affects their experience going forwards. Exactly. Um, ultimately, Boolean variables are exactly that. They, they are a way to switch on knowledge or, you know, sort of like the, the, the information that the, the player character has. Um, if you went back to replay it, you might still have that knowledge but your player character necessarily wouldn't because they're starting a game so there's sometimes a slight difference between the the player and the player character um yeah. but but you know boolean variables are brilliant because they can they can represent any just about anything you know you are you either have the information or you don't you either have the object in your inventory or you don't and so it's kind of like it's just a way of of uh, of setting setting a variable to represent that and then checking if that variable is true or or, or, or not um at, at relevant points okay yep yeah. and then we've got another here um running into problems with my complex narrative last time but with this new trick i should be more <laughs> successful <laughs> Yes, okay. yes. I, you know, sort of. It's very likely because I, you know, I got to a point last time where, yes, you would be, you would be running into these kind of things. And variables are are the way forward with that, um, as I hopefully, okay. as I've hopefully demonstrated properly. <laughs> yeah. Um. Yeah. So I, I wanted to just um show you as well before we finish today, um. I think I might have showed this last time, but I wanted to show it again. Steve's book, um, Writing for Video Games, and that's available to borrow as an ebook on our website, www.kirklees.gov.uk forward slash libraries. 
And also, if I can share my screen here. Um, um, there's also on that website, um, can you see that? There's some lots and lots of different uh, gaming books, computer gaming books that you can borrow for free. Um, okay, so yeah, there's there's absolutely loads of gaming books on there. So if you get the chance, have a browse through and you can borrow those for free. Okay. Yes, and, and I think that, you know, that there are there are so many, clearly so many good books, but, you know, sort of on, on the, you know, like the tools side, you know, developing games and stuff like this. I mean, I've, I've covered Twine here just because it's it's really useful for writing interactive stories. But for those people who want to get into programming or, um, you know, sort of like 3D art or, or this kind of thing, um, then it's really, um, it's really, you know, sort of like easy to get in, well, easy. <laughs> it, th there are, there are, you know, kind of plenty of, of free tools and, and, and so on that you can download. You know, kind of you can download a, f a free version of Unity, for example, which is a very powerful um, game creation tool. Um, it will take a, a bit of learning to get into, but there are tons of yeah. really useful, you know, kind of like tutorials and, and, and stuff like this. And, you know, sort of, and, and not just that, you know, sort of like you can find you know, sort of so free software for, for 3D graphics, for 2D graphics, um, and, and a tons of other stuff. And as I say, you know, sort of, there are always lots and lots of video tutorials and, and, and the like available, just about everything, yeah. you know. And, and, and so I've, I've, I've done this, you know, sort of like fairly brief, you know, sort of couple of sessions. Um, obviously, there's tons more that, that, pe that people can learn um and and it's just a case of of going out there and finding you know yeah. more examples and more tutorials and stuff like this fantastic brilliant stuff yeah lovely um so before we go today would would you like to say a little bit about next week's session chris um about yes the, yeah. yeah thank you steve <laughs> that's absolutely fantastic and a brilliant introduction for anybody and it just goes to show you that you don't need to be particularly digitally literate because you no. are there to help people become you know they're a little bit more digital literate writers like me who can't do anything in terms of coding i think even i managed to figure a little bit of it out so it's good we can go back and we can go back and we can learn and we can keep pausing the video and and work together on it and that's just fantastic and the thing that we were talking about before the broadcast this morning was about how fantastic it is in the world of gaming and increasingly in the world of all other forms of writing this open sourcing approach that we now have you know we're not mm -hmm. reliant on the big publishers and the big you know gaming houses and we can actually do this ourselves it's very empowering um it doesn't mean to say that you know you compromise on the quality of your writing and of what you're doing but i think that's that's absolutely you know the gaming industry has led on this in um mm -hmm. in terms of just developing your own writing and asking each other and supporting each other as a community and i think that's what we're all about with the libraries it's about you know it doesn't matter whether you've got any money or not you can still be creative and get your work out mm -hmm. there um and that brings me on to a cunning um theme switch there fair trade fortnight because it's fair trade fortnight now and next week's session is with bruce crowther who is the fair the, the founder of the fair trade towns movement the international movement um and he is you know he's a he's a legend in the world of fair trading and again this is all about you know trying to tackle the people that kind of have a stranglehold over trade and money and, and you know and keeping their little person down so that is our session next week i'm going to be interviewing about his life story a book he's writing about how he founded the fair trade towns movement where it all began where we are now what more needs to be done and that's so that's next thursday uh 5th of march at 11 a.m and you can watch it again as well send your questions in for bruce and share it with anybody um, you know that wants to make the world a bit of a, a fairer place to live in so hopefully you can join us next week and it just remains to yeah, say yeah. thank you steve that's just yeah. brilliant really helped oh, me get my head around how it all works and 
yeah, yeah. Sure well, there's lots of people out there who as long as great. as long as people have got something from it i I'm, I'm you know i'm glad i've done it <laughs> it's brilliant and, um, you know thank you very much for inviting me along thank you thank you very much thanks for coming along bye-bye and goodbye everybody bye, -bye. bye.